That's why I'm going real quick and briefly in the Holy Ghost. A hope that make it not a shame. As saints of God, as people of God, we have to walk in the hope that make it not a shame. There are some things that cause shame uh, uh, on us, you know, and I hear some things that was being expressed, you know. There are some situations we get in that can cause shame, that can cause hurt. I've experienced it, you experienced it, and others have experienced it, and it has come before the foundation of the world, and, and when it came in before the foundation of the world, God knew it was going to come in, so he sent us a remedy. He sent us a solution, and that solution is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. He is a high priest that cannot and can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Jesus Christ is not so high and he's not so low to where he cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He in all points was tempted like we are, but yet did not sin. And yet, when we hurt, he said, I, I know what you're hurting, I know why you're hurting. So thereby we put our trust and our hope in Jesus Christ. The one who has experienced every hurt, every dimension of sin, everything that sin has put on humanity because of disobedience to God in the garden. Jesus Christ knows when we're hurting. Why? Because he's experienced the same hurt. He knows when we've been rejected. Why? Because he's experienced the same rejection. He knows. When, when you're being spit on and mocked at and laughed at and, and, and the reproaches made upon your name and upon what you're doing and the work that you're doing, he know about it. Why? Because he experienced the same thing. But he went through it in love and in faith and in trust. And how did he do that? Because first of all, he despised the shame of what he went to. But at the same time, he saw something greater than the shame. And that was the hope and the glory that was set before him. He didn't just see the cross, but he saw beyond the cross. He didn't see the grave, but he saw the beyond the grave. What do you mean? First of all, the cross represents suffering. And Jesus Christ said, if any man come after me, and that means woman, boy, or girl, let him or her take up his cross and follow me daily. And in following Jesus, we're going to experience hurt. We're going to experience shameful situations. We're going to experience backbiters, liars, false accusers, false brethren, false sisters, false preachers, false teachers. We're going to experience that. But the thing is, we want to make sure we're real. Amen. Amen. We're going to experience that. We're not getting out of that. So because we're going to experience it, what we do, we despise the shame of what we're going through. Amen. But we look for a better. And we look for a city, as the patriarch said, that is not made by hand. We look for something more glorious than what we went through. Because why? Because first of all, there's a crown of life set up for each of us. If we can just latch hope and hold on to the faith and the love of God. If we can love Judas in our life. Judas is the one that sells us out. <laughs> for money. For silver, for gold, for fame, for fortune, for, for authority, for position. Because if Judas will sell y'all for any reason. Amen. If we can love Judas and still help Judas at the same time. If we can bless them that curse us. If we can pray for them <laughs> that despitefully misuse us. If we can say, Lord, bless them. If we can give water or we can give food to them that have lied on us and have spoken evil against us. The Bible tells us, he said, if you're in and hunger, he said, feed them. For in doing so, you're going to heap coals of fire upon their head. And then God is going to reward us. And if we can do this, and we can, in Jesus, and we can do it by the spirit and the authority of the word of God. Amen. Amen. Oh, it can be done. So it's not hard for us because the Bible says the way of a transgressor is hard. I mean, that's somebody who continues in sin, and sin is still a lifestyle for them. But it's saying it's not hard to love. It's not hard to forgive. It's not hard to be selfless so that we won't be selfish. <laughs> Oh, it's not hard to do that. But it is when you're walking in sin. Amen? So we have a hope that make it not a shame. And 
And we want to go to Brother James in the Bible. I, I thank God for Brother James. And we want to go to James chapter 1. And James chapter 1, and this is where the foundation of what we're talking about is going to start from. James chapter 1 and verse 2 through 4. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. We're going to understand that the trying of our faith worketh patience. We don't have to understand to let patience have her perfect work. We will not allow patience to have her perfect work if we don't realize that in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of when it looks like the promises of God are not coming through, in the midst of when it looks like we're studying loving people and they're not loving us, and we started giving and doing all God would have us to do, and we still don't see the kind of results that we would like to see, we're going to have to understand that all that we do, we do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Just like Paul said, it's no longer I that live, but the Christ that lives within me. We're going to have to understand that what we're doing, we're doing it in the faith of God and in the faith of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when we encounter sufferings, and we encounter all kinds of ungodly things that people lying on you, even lying for you, even lying to you, you know. When we encounter all that, because people lie for you for the wrong reason. When we encounter all that, we're going to find out that we have to go through this in order to be perfected as saints of God. Perfected in the spirit of excellence, which is a spirit of purity and chastity and integrity. So we have to go through all of this so that our, what, our character and our personalities would be like Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Let's look at what James says. James says, my brother, count it all joy when ye fall into divers, mean many temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now in the midst of the trying of our faith, verse 5 tells us, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But the next verse says, but ask in faith, don't be wavering, don't be doubting. When we are going through trials and diverse temptations and all manners of things, we need to ask God for wisdom on how to go through it. Amen. God, give me wisdom on how to go through, how to deal with this backbiter. Give me wisdom on how to deal with Judah. Give me wisdom on how to deal with lack and how to deal with suffering. Give me wisdom, Lord, on, on when I'm loving them and I'm reaching out and, and the same thing is not being given back unto me. Amen. Give me wisdom on how to deal with this, God. How would you have me to deal with it? Amen. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom when to speak and when not to speak. The Bible says up in Proverbs 31, talks about the virtuous woman, how that in her mouth is the law of kindness. So whatever you speak, it comes from on the inside. Nobody's saying nothing off the top of their head. Uh -huh. If that ain't just slipped out your mouth, if that comes out, that's in the heart because that's a heart issue. Because the Bible says, guard your hearts, but with guard your hearts because with all diligence. But first of all, out of it flows the issues of life. So whatever the issues you have going on in your heart about life, about things, about people, about circumstances, even about situations. That issue is going to come up out of your mouth. Uh -huh. Amen? So what we need to do, ask God for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. And so, and so instead, of us, instead of us taking on the mind of, of, of things that are not like God, what we do, we take on the mind of Christ. So when you know you got an enemy in the room or in your house, wherever the enemy may be at, because sometimes they, they be in your house. We're going to get that in a few minutes. Now, the person ain't your enemy, but the spirit of the enemy starts operating. So the Bible said, do what? If your enemy hunger, feed him. Buy him some food. Give him some food. People in your job, you know they back by you, they, they, they digging ditches for you. Uh, throw a potluck for everybody. Or oh, some church is chicken. You know, I just thought about y'all. I was going to give everybody lunch today. I do that. <laughs> I used to do it a lot. <laughs> You know, go ahead and surprise with the faith. Feed them. Do it out of love. Amen? 
Because you keep putting love on folk. Folk got to be crazy to be hating on you. You started showing love. Somewhere they're going to turn. They're going to say, I got to be crazy. This brother loved me. Amen? So ask God for wisdom in the midst of situation. Now, let's go. Let's, let's go to, and I want to go to another foundation scripture. We want to go to 2 Peter 1, uh, verse 5 through 7. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 5 through 7. Because God, God wants us to be able to walk in victory, and He wants us to walk in a hope that make it not a shame. We have a hope that make it not a shame. We don't want to walk around here mourning the blues because of whatever's going on with us. God is trying to do something in us and through us, and He's trying to mold some things in us when we're going through our trials. And if we're going to do great things for God, that means that great suffering has to come about. Amen. That means great suffering comes about. If we if we're called to greatness in God and we are, we're not gonna get, we're not gonna achieve the greatness that God has for us without going through great suffering. Amen? Amen. Now he says over in 2 Peter, and we're looking at uh, chapter 1, and I'm gonna start where it says, uh, Let's go to, let's start at verse 3, first of all. He says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. First of all, Peter says, according to his divine power has given us, who has given us? God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And verse 4 says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promise. We have exceeding great and precious promises given unto us, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Whose divine nature? Jesus Christ. Uh -huh having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, so that we may be partakers of the divine nature, which is the divine nature of Jesus Christ. How? Having escaped the corruption that's in the world. So Paul said on one occasion, oh, that I may know him and the power, first of all, oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. If we're going to know Jesus Christ and the power of resurrection, also in the fellowship of his suffering, we're going to have to suffer. So that means some are going to have to die and some are going to have to be resurrected. Because, because Paul said, in the power of his resurrection. Resurrection means to be brought to life. Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection. When Mary and them came to him and said, Jesus, if you'd have been here, uh, my brother Lazarus would have not died. And then so Jesus Christ says, well, he's going to be, then she turns around and says, well, I know he's going to be raised up in the last day. And so Jesus Christ says, okay, and she says that's the resurrection. And he's standing there listening to her and he's telling her, I am the resurrection. Amen. You don't have to wait for the angel of days. I'm not only the resurrection, but I'm the angel of days. I'm the beginning and the last. I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm he that was in the year and that was in the years to come. I'm he that is going to die and then I'm going to be alive forevermore. Amen. So the resurrection. Now, now in order for us to be resurrected with Christ, raised up with him, we're going to have to suffer. And we have to have fellowship in the suffering. What in the world is fellowship and suffering? Who in the world want to have fellowship and suffering? Now, everybody can fellowship. We all have a good time and party and hearty, hearty, you know. And we all, you know, everybody, you know, got food in the icebox and the cat is overflowing. We got enough to give the neighbors and their family and everybody else. We got a car where we can drive and take everybody. We're not worrying about nothing in bank accounts, you know. Our health is doing well. The church's health is doing well. And ministries is flowing and, and all this right here. But then at the same time, that, that part, you done got to that part after you done got to the suffering. That's the glory part. That, that's the end result of the suffering. So, so Paul says, in order to know the Lord, we're going to have to fellowship in the same suffering that Jesus Christ suffered in. Amen. We don't know him when everything is going well. 
we learn him in the midst of suffering. Why? Because in that we call on Jesus Christ. And then we call on the Lord who will show us great and mighty things that we know not. Jeremiah 33 and 3. This is how we know him. Job said on one occasion in the midst of his suffering, he said, now I've known of you and I've heard of you. He said, but now I know you like I need to really know you. Amen. I know you really now. I know I knew you. Yes, yes, but I, yes. I really know you now, and we're going to see what the word no action means. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And so, so we want to be able to take on the divine nature and be more like Christ. We want to die daily, and suffering will help us to die. Help our, help our flesh to die. Help our ways and our thoughts to die. Amen? Verse 5 says, and besides this, giving all diligence to your faith, he said, virtue. So we want to walk in the faith of God, and then we want to give diligence to our faith, and with our faith we want to add virtue. Now let's look at the word virtue. First of all, virtue has to do with excellence. Uh -huh. Virtue means excellence. He says, he says now, now and besides this, uh, giving our diligence, add to your faith. Now you trust God, you believe God, now I believe God's word, and I'm practicing faith, and I'm speaking faith, and I'm talking faith, and now he said to do what? He said, add to your faith virtue. What is virtue? Excellence. Amen. Add excellence. Be, 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 be perfected in what you're doing, in what we're doing. Add excellence to it. In everything that we do, the smallest of things, we need to add excellence to it. If you clean the bathroom, you need to clean the bathroom enough to where somebody can want to put food on top of it without having a plate in there, just so to speak. And you ought to clean it just that good. Because why? A spirit of excellence should operate in every area of our life. Amen. Every area of our life. Amen. Anytime we're walking in the faith of God, do you not know that we're walking in perfection? You know why? Because God expects perfection and he expects excellence. Amen. That's why with the talents, he gave one five, he gave somebody else two, and he gave somebody one. Well, the one that had this one buried it and then gained no kind of interest. In other words, there was no type of fruit or accumulation with the one talent. Amen. God expects what he gives us to be multiplied. Yes. Not decreased, but to be multiplied. And the only way to multiply it, we have to work it how? Through faith. Amen. Because faith is an action. Amen? Amen. Now, through, vir through virtue, he said, let's add excellence. Let's add excellence. Now, and to virtue, knowledge. Now we're adding excellence in what we're doing. We're doing our best. We're giving it 110% and on top of that and then some more. Now he said, add knowledge. Let me show you what knowledge means. And also, when you look at virtue, virtue also means moral goodness. It means moral goodness. If anybody tell you that we can't live free and separated from sin, they are not telling the truth because moral goodness represents that. Amen. Free and separated from sin. We ain't lying, we ain't tipping and dipping, we ain't committing fornication, we're not committing adultery, we're not lying on an income tax. We're not lying, you know, and robbing and cheating and stealing, talking about we got five children on the on the phone, we ain't got a warrant, we ain't doing none of that, we ain't putting other people on our income tax, trying to claim and all this kind of madness. So what we are doing, we are walking in moral goodness. We, we ain't cursing out our wife and, and husband and speaking good to everybody else again. So, you know, we're, we're, we're walking in moral excellence, not in perversion. Anything else, the opposite of morality is perversion. Amen. So he said, add to that excellence, which is moral goodness. Amen? Amen. Now, look what it says here, knowledge. He said, now, to virtue, we need to add some knowledge here. We need to add some knowledge. Let's add some knowledge. Knowledge means to understand, to know, in the English version of how we know knowledge. Knowledge means to understand and to know. When you go to the Hebrew, Hebrew version of it, it means yada. Yada means to perceive, to understand, to consider, to discern, to discover. That's what knowledge means. Who are we discerning? Who are we trying to understand? What are we trying to consider? What are we trying to discover? God. Amen. God. Yes. That's what we are doing. We are trying to discern what? His ways. We are trying to discern what? His will. We are trying to discover what? His purpose in our life. 
We're trying to discover what? His direction in our life. So knowledge, she said add knowledge to it. It's not just to know to accumulate it, but to have the understanding of it and discern the knowledge and perceive what we have. Perceive that God is holy so that we can be a holy people. Amen. Perceive that God says, perceive that God means holiness means purification. Perceive that knowledge of what that really means. Amen. Perceive what it means when God says pay your tithes and the Bible says give your offering. Perceive that it means when you receive that type of knowledge that he says I will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you shall not have room enough to receive. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Amen. Perceive the knowledge. When you accumulate that knowledge, perceive it. Why? Because you need to be able to act on it. Perceive it. Discern it. Discern what that knowledge is for. God, you told me if I do this, you'll do this. Now, Lord, I'm expecting this. I'm expecting it to be done to me according to your word. Amen. Amen. Perceive it. Understand how to use knowledge to write. That's where the wisdom part come in at. Amen. Amen. And then he says, now, when you're looking at knowledge, I want to show you something else about knowledge. When you go to knowledge, even in, when you go to knowledge, and that was in the Hebrew, when you go to knowledge in the Greek, it means get on seco. It means to know absolutely. To know absolutely without a shot of a doubt. To know absolutely. We need to know that we know that we know absolutely while we profess, while we walk in, while we live in, and the faith of God that's in Christ Jesus. So that we may be able to give an answer to anybody that asks us. We need to be able to know absolutely that we're saved. We need to know absolutely that we're sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. We need to know absolutely, you know, that we are walking in the good and perfect will of God and that we are proving those things that are excellent. We need to know this. Amen. And the more we know this, the more when suffering comes, we don't have to be ashamed of what we're going through. Amen. And we don't have to let the devil tell us, well, you know, y'all was saying this right here, and y'all was talking about y'all gonna do this right here, and, and you're gonna have this right here, and think, I'm telling y'all, this is how the Lord was dealing with me on this morning and on the other night. To walk in the hope that make it not a shame. I'm not, I, you know, I can't be ashamed of what it may not look like and what others may be saying, what it may not look like. Oh, well, they said this and they said that and they ain't happening. Yeah, but it's gonna happen. This is not gonna happen in the spirit realm, and I promise you, it's happening in the natural realm. Amen. So whatever God promised, He's gonna bring it to pass. That's right. Whatever we stand on in God, He's gonna bring it to pass. Amen. So that's the hope that make it not a shame. Amen. Amen. Now that he says, not only to knowledge, when you're looking at knowledge, it has to also do with, uh, in the Greek, when you're dealing with knowledge, it means to know, to recognize. It frequently indicates a relation between the person knowing, which is us, which is us, the person knowing, and the object known, which is God. The person, it's a relationship between the one that needs to know and the object that you're trying to find out about, which is God. In this respect, what is known is of value. Because once we learn that what we know is of value, we hold on to it for dear life. Amen. We won't let nobody change our mind, change our heart. You know, when we know we got a crown of life laid up for us, we're not going to go back on God. We ain't going to be backsliding. We ain't going to be giving up. When we know that God has a far exceeding great and purpose for us and expected end for us, we are not going to give up. We will stand firm on it. Amen. We will stand firm on it. And yes, wavering will come at the same time. Yes, doubt will try to come. It will speak to your mind. Fear will speak to your mind. But we don't have to accept it. It's like somebody start knocking. If don't nobody say come in, you ain't coming in. <laughs> if don't nobody answer that door when somebody knock on the door at your house, they can't come in. Unless they kick it in. And the devil ain't going to knock down the door of your mind for you to make him let him in. You have to willing to let him in. Same way with God. God ain't going to knock down the door of our mind to accept his way and his will. And his good and perfect will. He's not going to do that. He'll knock at the door. Jesus Christ said, Behold, over in Revelation. He said, I stand at the door knocking. If any man let me come in. He said, I'll come in and I'll sup with him. Amen. I'll sup with him. That's what he said. Amen. <laughs> All right, here, good God. I am so excited about that. So now, when we're looking at that, 
And he says to knowledge, we want to add some temperance. Yes. Oh my God, help us today on that. To knowledge add temperance. Temperance has to do with self-control. So she need to brought that out real good. Self-control. Temperance, look, 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 look. Temperance deals with, with self-control. He said, once you got the knowledge, now you need to be temperate with it. Be temperate with what we know. Let's not be big in with what we know. Let's not think we know more than other people. Let's not, let's, let's, let's not get what, what God has allowed us to know to, to, to exalt ourselves. Because see, the Bible talks about knowledge puffing up. It puffs up. It puffs up. It makes you a cabbage head. And I used to tell God, God help me. Don't let me be a cabbage head no more. Take it away. When I first got saved to the choir, I said, Lord, take it away. I'm a cabbage head. Take it away, Lord. And I said, give me a, to be a little Brussels sprout. Because see, see, Brussels sprouts, they're like miniature baby cabbages, but they don't swell and burst. A cabbage, it gets so big, it'll just, it'll just burst down the sink. And we're going to catch that on the way going home, I think. <laughs> so, Lord, help me to be a little Brussels sprout, Lord. Don't let me get so big here and so full of myself and so full of, you know, what, what belongs to you. So I think I'm all this and this and more, you know. Because the Bible said that uh, let he that think he, let he that think he stand, take heed lest he fall. Yeah. So, so we want to add some, no, we want to add some temper. Let's be temper, you know. Let, let, you know, let's not get all, you know, all, all out of proportion with things. You know, if you can do something real good and you do it real good and you diligent in it, don't have a fit with somebody else and not doing it. <laughs> because that ain't adding temperance. I'm telling you, it's not. You, you see, if, if, if I can do what I do good in the Lord, and you ain't good at what you do, and I know you ought to be better than what you do, <laughs> it's no need of me getting all out of proportion because you know who I know you ought to be at in the Lord. And anything that you do naturally spiritually, I don't need to get all, you know, all up here, bent out of shape, that temper, that flesh in the way. Because I ain't going to help you in that kind of weak state that you're in. Because I'm strong in that area, but you're weak in that area. So what happens if I don't watch it, I'll let my strength that God has given me cause me to be exalted. And then I'll start putting you down in your weakness where I know you ain't strong yet. My husband is good with time. He's very disciplined with time. Pastor's very disciplined with time. He's very disciplined when it comes to vision and purpose. Those are two of the things that I, that I see greatly that God will increase me in is time and to be disciplined because without discipline, we cannot pursue vision and purpose. Mm -hmm. We can't do it. We will not do it. Amen? Yeah. So let's be, let's be temperate. He said, add temperance. Oh my God, help us today. When you talk about adding temperance, self-control, let's have some self-control. Let's have an attitude and conduct of a person who is God-fearing. Let's not have the attitude that, that demonstrates, you know, I can't take nothing. If you do anything, your grave will fall over my plate. I'm going to knock out your plate, out your grave out my plate, and knock your plate out too. Let, let's show some temperance, amen? Amen. He said, amen. add to it. This is how you know you're growing. Check it by these words right here. Amen? Amen. amen. And then he says, and the temperance, patience. Okay, now, oh, God, help us with this in the day. Let's add some patience in what we're doing. Let's be patient. It took God six days to do creation. And our time is 6,000 years. For him, it's six days. For us, it's 6,000 years. You know why? Because one day with the Lord is like a 1,000 years. A 1,000 years with the Lord is like one day. Amen. So, so, because one day is eternity. And we're looking at 6,000, we're looking at 1,000, that's in time. That's in time. So let, let, let's be patient, let's be patient. You know, I don't see so many impatient people now of days in my life. You be driving, if you just go hunting, you just got on the road good. You just got on the road good. And they just, oh, you get out the way, you don't, you know, you just, oh my God, you know. <laughs> No temperance, no self-control, you know, so we, so, so we got to take responsibility for our own action. We really have to do that. And then we're going to tell the people, oh, you're going to make me late. And we just drive. You, you ain't going to make me late. No, 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 no. You will make your own self late because, first of all, you did not follow the law of time. <laughs> and we did not respect time because if we respect time, we know it's going to take us 30 minutes to get to work 
and we're going to get up. No, we have to be at work at 6 30, and we're going to get up at 5 45, talking about getting ready. <laughs> and we're going to believe it ourselves. We're going to make the work at 6 30. Well, that ain't happening. That is not happening. Unless you go to bed full of dress and got your car already cranked up and everything got in your car. That is not happening. Unless you got a jet sitting out there in the yard and it's going to zoom you up 75 or 635, it's not happening. So, 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 we, so we got to be honest with ourselves. We got to be honest with ourselves. So, so let's add some patience. So we, we so, Let me show you how you add patience when you start taking an inventory of how you do things and how you go in and out. Amen. Take an inventory of how you get yourself ready. Take an inventory of how when people pick you up, let's just go there. <laughs> now, when, when people pick you up, are you ready? Do your ride have to wait on you? Do you keep your ride in the car three, four, five minutes? Take an inventory. That's how we do that. Amen? I, I know it got silent and holy quiet Amen. here. But you know, my God, we're talking about, we're talking about, now we are talking about walking the hope and making out of shame. In order to do that, we got to be fair and honest with ourselves. That's the only way we can do that. So the Lord had to teach me that one day I was on the road, and, and I was saying, who are these people going to make me late? They're going to make me late. And, I'm, and I, I don't need long because I'm not a mad driver. I, I, don't, I don't have a mad spirit, and I don't have a spirit of anger. So, so what happened? I was like, who are they going to make me late? I was like, goodness, they're going to make me late. I'm just driving. I'm just driving. And then I, I did that for so long, and the Holy Ghost said, no, 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 look. He said, the people are not going to make you late. If you would have left the house, first of all, if you would have gotten up in time, you would have left the house on time, and now you wouldn't be under pressure <laughs> on the road, Amen. trying to drive, and you're going to have a wreck, and then you're going to have a wreck, and you ain't going to get to where you're going, or if you don't have a wreck, the police going to come up, and they're going to stop you, so now you know you're going to be late now, because they're going to take their time trying to check you out to see if you got any other kind of record. Amen. <laughs> So the Lord had to help me with that one. He said, ain't hey, the people fault, it's your fault, you leave on time. Amen. Amen. Get up on time, then you can leave on time. Amen. So, so let's, and let's see, let's look at those things that cause us to not be tempered and cause us to not be patient, you know. And you know what? You got to be patient with one another. Because, you know, you may not be slow for somebody else is slow for you. Got, you know, you got to be patient with a person that's slow. You do. Because it's for you to be patient. And if they see you being patient long enough, hopefully, <laughs> they're getting hairy. <laughs> but if you ain't patient and you all up here with temperance and you just out, you know we got to be on time. We got to come home. We got to get out of here. I can't stand being late. Well, you ain't helping the situation. <laughs> You're not helping the situation. Because now your mind is rushing <laughs> and your mind is in a strain. And that same strain of mind gonna fall off another person that's slowful, and then the slowful person gonna get nervous. Yeah, the slowful person get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, help us today. So we can help one another and help ourselves. Amen. 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 <laughs> and it says, and when you look at that patience, patience deal with to be forbearing. To endure, some things we may not like, but if we love, we will endure. We have to endure so people can get better. That's the whole purpose. As saints of God, we have to endure so that people will get better. Amen? Amen. Amen, amen. Now, to endure has to do with consistency. I love this, you know, I love this right here when you're talking about consistency. Now, uh, uh, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter uh, 7, and I read the verse, I mean, look, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and, 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 and he teaches us real good on what to do, you know. We want, we want to do things to help one another and not want to help, and one another not be in the strain, because that's what we do as people of God. See, as people of God, we have to walk in the hope that make it out of shame. And when we do that, shame won't be on us and we won't cause shame on others. Amen. We won't cause shame on others because that's what we're about. We're not about doing anything that's going to make a shame and, and, and cause a shame. Amen. We endure the shame despising it because we see something great. Amen. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse uh, 8 says, 
Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 8. He says, better uh, is the end of a thing than the beginning. Why? Because the Bible talks about don't despise small beginnings. So mm -hmm. it may look like it's not much when you put a seed in the ground. If you're a farmer, if you're a person that has to grow vegetables, but don't despise that because the end of it is going to be great. That's what we have to see here at God's Exit Bible Fellowship Church. The end of what God has in the end is greater than our beginning. Amen? Mm -hmm. He said better the end of the thing than the beginning of it. Why? Because you're going to see the fruits of your labor and we can walk and walk and be patient. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud. A person proud in spirit don't want to take nothing, don't want to go through nothing, don't want to suffer nothing, mm -hmm. don't want to suffer. That's why, that's how come you get a chance to know one another when we suffer with one another. That's how you know people. If you suffer in love with them, not in backbiting, not, not, not in hatred, not in malice, but if we suffer in love, if we suffer in love with them, that's how we are able to fellowship and have true fellowship with people. And that's how you get a chance to know people, when we fellowship in love. Amen? Amen. So, so let's not be proud in spirit. And let everything we do so that we can get better. God wants to be better in everything that we do. Amen? All right, and, uh, and forbearing one another, loving one another, being compassionate and tenderhearted towards one another. All this is people that have patience. You have to forbear. You have to, you have to, I'm going to drive this home. We have to endure things that we don't like about people, about situations. We have to endure and we have to do that with patience. If you see something keep getting on your nerves, <laughs> If that keep getting on your nerves, oh God, I need some more patience in here. <laughs> this ain't working. Lord, help me. You see something going on with husband and wife, and you ain't never saw it before. You go, Who? where that come from, Lord? Oh God, give me some patience. Oh God, help me, help me, help me, help me. Patience didn't do it this year. I don't know about this, Lord, but give me some patience. Amen. <laughs> All right, then. And then he says also, now, let, now let's go back over there where it says over there in the, in the last one he says, patience, godliness. I love this. Godliness. Godliness represents holiness. Holiness <coughs> in the Greek represents piety, which is characterized by a God-ward attitude that does, this does what it means that the things that are well pleasing in the sight of God. Godliness, anytime you see N-E-S-S, -S, that's a continuation. We do things continually that's pleasing in the sight of God. We are good stewards over everything that God has given us. From houses, cars, land, apartments, clothing, whatever it may be. We've got to be good stewards over everything that God gave us. If we don't, we're being lazy and slowful, and we're being like that servant in the Bible who God calls a slowful and lazy servant. Do you not know to be slowful and lazy is a sin? Slowfulness is a sin. Laziness is a sin. Because it don't represent godliness. It doesn't represent godliness. It's a dangerous state to be in. Amen? Amen. 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 It's a dangerous state to be in. And, and so, so we want to do things that's pleasing to the Lord. Uh, uh, when you're looking at godliness, it also represents doctrine. When we build up on the doctrine of God, the word of God, the truth of God, which produces godly fruit. If we're not building up on God's word and the truth of God and the doctrine, uh, 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 and we're not building up on uh, the word of God through revelation, through understanding, because if we are building up on it, first of all, it's going to produce results. And the only way to do it has to get in our hearts and mind first, because the word of God washes the heart and mind. He washes it so it can be clean. That's where the sanctification comes in, that his word washes. So we have to build up on the things of God, the truth of God, the word of God, so that it will produce a godly character, a godlike character in us. Amen? Amen. And then thereby we do things that are pleasing to God. Uh, and also when it comes to the truth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Godliness also represents the fear of God. The Bible said the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. 
Amen? So fear him means to respect him, to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. We don't want to do anything that causes God to be angry with us or to be displeased with us. So what we do in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our situations, in the midst of what we're going through, what we don't understand, we do those things by seeking God for wisdom to carry out even our day-to-day -day activities. We seek God for strength to do the things we need to do in our home when it comes to the, for the church, when it comes to for the ministry. You know, we seek God for the wisdom, and when we do it, we have to get up with action and work behind it. We can't say, God, give me strength, and then we don't do nothing. Well, he going to give us strength to do nothing for us. He gives us strength so we can be productive, and so that we can have the strength to do what needs to be done. Amen? Amen. Amen. We want to walk in again the hope that make it not a shame, because we had it. Let's give God a hand praise, and I'm excited about walking the hope that make it not a shame. <laughs>